In today's video, we'll be taking the semi-retired, beat-up Path Dragon on our longest journey yet to see exactly how far this particular bike can go on a single tank of gas. I'm gonna do it off the bridge. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do it off the bridge. Before leaving on our journey today, we put up a poll on the community page to see if any of you could guess how far the bike would go. Some of you were very close. Others were quite optimistic and rather generous with your guesses. Well, it's not the godlike gas tank that some of you may be carrying. It did go quite a bit further than I expected. The bike's configuration for this journey is using the stock 44 tooth sprocket on 27 and a half inch wheels. We're using a cheap China doll motor with no modifications, with the exception of a quarter inch hole drilled in the exhaust cap. And something that I should have mentioned in the community post for the question, which would have definitely helped some of you with your guesses, is that we're using the stock 2 liter gas tank that comes with most of these generic kits. Because I'm expecting to run out of gas somewhere along the way, I will be carrying a spare gas tank with me. But just so you guys know there's no funny business, the entire unedited raw trip will be linked in the description. As I don't expect anybody to want to watch a full two and a half hour video of me riding for this entire trip, it's there nonetheless. And although this video is primarily to see how far we can get on a 2 liter gas tank, there is a few other things we can test along the way. More of an endurance test. Seeing that I've never actually ridden a motorized bike for such an extended period of time, we'll find out exactly how comfortable it was at the end of the day, the fatigue, stress, anything that might pop up, as well as how well the clutch pads handle this, because yes, this is the bike with no bike chain. So this entire trip is purely done on the motor. Could I get a few more miles if I was pedaling? I'm sure, but usually I don't pedal anyway, so that's a moot point. And to help kill some time along the way, we'll be answering some viewer comments. So if you've asked a question in the past few weeks, stay tuned because there's a good chance it'll be answered in this video. This video is not meant to set any records. I'm just riding the bike I have on the path I normally ride. For the majority of the video, it's going to be a loose gravel path. If you're looking to get maximum miles per gallon, doing things like using a larger rear wheel with a smaller rear sprocket can certainly help. Keep in mind that four strokes probably get better miles to the gallon than my two stroke setup. Although this bike is motor power only, while on the side of the road, you might see me pedaling due to legality reasons mentioned in previous videos. All right, we got her good and topped off, best we can. What I've done with the video is uh, the GoPro is only recording at 30 frames a second. I normally do 60 because it just looks better. But 30 frames a second will allow the GoPro to run cooler because it won't have to work as hard, in theory, anyways. It's uh, time to readjust those front brakes. I did try to use the GPS app on my phone to record this entire trip, but it turns out that every time I open my phone, the app glitches out. So I was only able to record the return trip. We essentially doubled this, and it matched up with Google Maps, where we got our total mileage. 
SB Airsoft has a few questions posted on one of the videos we have on the Patreon page, so I'll do my best to answer what I can. For what I'm assuming is his first build, he's planning a 15 mile scenic route. I think that's awesome. But he would like to know what a few things that I bring with me are. I'm also going to give him a tip. The tip. First off, while you're in the break in period, I recommend not going on any trips that are beyond walking distance, or at least if you don't have a ride available. Generally, most of the issues that pop up on these bikes are concentrated within the break in period. For tools, I like to bring the basic tools. Screwdrivers, pliers, crescent wrench, 10 millimeter. Spark plug is a must. Those die from time to time for just random reasons. And although I like to carry a spare CDI and magneto with me just for peace of mind, honestly, I've never had to use them once. But these are known to just randomly go out from time to time. Zip ties, Velcro straps, spare inner tube, a patch kit, and that's really all I can think of off the top of my head. Be sure to have some duct tape. I like those one inch wide gorilla strip rolls. And some spare fuel line. And the last mention of his comet was something I never considered, but actually I think it's a good idea. Now that I've given it more thought, it seems to make sense. He's considering using an actual motorcycle helmet on his motorized bike. Now, I know a lot of you might think this is kind of overkill, and for a while I thought a motorcycle helmet on a motorized bike was quite overkill myself, although I have used them in the cold, rainy nights. But his reasoning for using a motorcycle helmet seems to make sense. A lot of drivers don't notice motors on these bikes, so they don't realize how fast you're going. If you're wearing a regular bike helmet, you look pretty incognito. But if you have a motorcycle helmet on, you get a little more noticed, and drivers might take a second glance and realize that you're actually going faster than they think you are. So, the reason for using a motorcycle helmet is just to be noticed. And obviously it's more protection. But once they realize that you're going faster, it doesn't really look out of place. That's all there is to it! A lot of deer bones! I don't think. Too good. Too good. I almost forgot. While I'm here, I'm going to check the geocache real quick. Also, check my tire, make sure it's not rubbing. Oh, yeah, she's good. Okay, cool. you guys ever ride on these rail trails, I know this is niche, only a few of you might do it, but if you come up to these bridges, be real careful. If you get these just a little bit wet, like in the morning or after it rains, it's like walking on snot. It is really slippery. I almost washed out one time. So when it's wet, I always walk across it. We have a geocache here that a couple of people have found. Uh, one person's found since I checked it last. Yeah, there it is. Uh, most of you probably already know what geocaching is. Uh, it's, this is the first you ever heard of it. It's just a fun little side hobby. You put these little boxes or, well, pretty much anything that can be water resistant in random places. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. People find them, they sign the log, they take a treasure out, and they put a treasure in. Looks like this might have got wet in that last rainstorm, so I might have to redo the log. Let's see here. All right, what do we see? I put pretty interesting treasures in this. I got a, a keychain 9mm that I made myself. Somebody put a 45 Colt cartridge in here. Hey, like-minded individual. Valve cap covers. Uh, this is something my girl made. It's got some shiny stuff and a little glass vial. Like shadow box treasures, you know. Yep, he found it on the 17th of this month. Right on, Joshua. Very cool. A lot of water down there today. Oh, poor Henry. He wanted to come with us so bad. I'll probably take him for another ride Sunday. 
Robert asked why the prices on the eBay kits have increased significantly over the past few weeks. My best guess, due to other viewer suggestions, is that this has to do with the COVID-19 crisis. Either people taking advantage of the situation or import restrictions have something to do with it. I don't expect it to last for too long, so hold out. Prices should come back down. Either way, Amazon still has kits and they seem to be around the same price. A little bit more expensive than usual, but not much. JJ's situation sounds like he's running into two issues, the first being that the clutch is not engaging with the motor. This is usually caused by a loose flower nut under the clutch cover. Taking the clutch cover off, tightening the flower nut can usually fix this. Another issue could simply be that your clutch cable is not tight enough. If that still doesn't do it, then you probably have contaminated clutch pads. Grease or oil has gotten onto the clutch pads. The easiest way to deal with this is just to replace them. Trying to clean them off is not going to really work. You can try flipping them around, but usually the back side is more contaminated than the front. His second issue where he broke the chain while trying to get the bike to start is probably caused by having too much slack in your chain. If your chain is too loose, it can bind up in the top of the motor, break the chain, even break the case. A lot of people think they can run a chain tensioner and get away with having too much slack in their chain. This is not the case. The chain tensioner is to solve other issues, usually related to the rear sprocket not being true. But it's not meant to take the slack out of the chain. Because when you go to start the motor, all that slack moves to the top of the chain, binds up inside the motor. After witnessing the torturous situations we put the YD100 trail bike through, Drew wants to know why I ride a motorized bike instead of just getting a trail bike. Well, first off, Drew, I have a trail bike. It's always broke down pain in the ass to work on, the motorized bikes are simply more fun and easier to work on. There's something about putting a small motor on a cheap bike and seeing what you can get away with that's simply enjoyable. Plus, you built it yourself. I mean, there's about a thousand answers to this question, which is extremely open-ended. I'm not sure why people ask this question, but it pops up all the time. Also, you might keep in mind the obvious. Price is kind of a big deal. But, at least at the end of the day, you came to a census. Charles, please don't water cool your space heater. You'll die, bro. A few viewers have asked how I start this particular bike without a bike chain. I won't call it practical, nor am I doing it because I want to. I'm just too broke and lazy to fix the issue. And keep in mind, without a bike chain, if the motor breaks down, you can't pedal. And if you're going to be riding in traffic, it's a really slow start that looks kind of awkward. But if you're riding mostly trail like me, you can get away with it. For starting the motor when it's cold, I just give it some choke, roll down the hill, and she fires right up. Once the motor's hot, she's really easy to start. Just a couple of pushes, pop the clutch a couple of times, and she's off and running. Soul Survivor is fixated on using cruiser-style frames with motorized bikes. Where I have nothing against cruisers, I think they're great, easy builds, nice for street use. I believe he's completely wrong. There's no reason why you should only use a cruiser bike for a motorized bike. Mountain bikes are great. Mountain bikes are usually more rugged can withstand the motor in most situations. Of course, this all depends on the quality of frame you buy. However, I'd like to see somebody with a cruiser do the kind of riding I do. Through the mud, the rain, rough terrain with a YD100, 56.2 sprocket. Yeah, YOLO that. Let me see a video, and then I'll believe it. But that tree got struck by lightning. Alex wants to know if too much oil really matters for serious issues. Absolutely. And this is coming from somebody who generally uses more oil than a lot of people recommend. Though I tend to stick around 32 to 1, lately I've been using 40 to 1 just to see if I notice a difference. I do feel like it's a bit more peppy, but I'm not as confident riding on long stretches of trail on the 40 to 1. So I'll still stick with the 32 to 1. 
Of course, this all depends on what motor you have and what it recommends in the manual. We've been over this before. Anyways, too much oil can cause some issues. First off, it's going to nuke your spark plug. It'll foul that sucker right up. You'll get carbon buildup on your piston and head as well. And from what I understand, if you get enough carbon buildup, they'll start to tap against each other, cause pre-ignition or detonation. But I'm not a mechanic. I'm not going to go into all the issues that can be caused. <laughs> but the obvious, a lot of oil coming out of your exhaust. That cap will fill up and leak all over the place. You would also like to know if getting a smaller sprocket is worth it. Well, I generally ride trails, so smaller sprockets are not my forte. However, from what I understand, yes, you'll have more miles to the gallon. Obviously, you'll go faster. You won't have quite as much torque, but we all know this. A big benefit to having a smaller sprocket, as I've mentioned in previous videos, is it'll keep the engine cool. Because you'll be going faster at the same RPMs, your motor will get better air cooling. So, all around, I think a smaller sprocket is better for the bike. Puts less stress on the rear wheel, the hub, the spokes, the chain, the pulley, and all in all, I think it's just a good way to go. If you're going for longevity and speed, small sprocket, definitely the way to go. But important thing to keep in mind, as you go smaller sprocket, you go faster. As you go faster, you start to break speed limits, which are designed for these style of bikes. So it all just depends on what you want to try and get away with. Mr. Nolan would like to know what video editing software I use. And I use Movie Studio 14 Platinum. I believe it was originally made by Sony. It's kind of a knockoff to their Vegas. Uh, honestly, I don't have anything to compare it against. It's the only video editing software I've been using since I got serious about video editing because it was simply the one I had available. I think it was gifted to me. Anyways, I won't say it's very user friendly. It has quite a steep learning curve. I had to watch a lot of YouTube videos when I first started out to figure out how to get everything to work just right. I've been using it for so long now that I'm happy with it, but I think there's better options out there. As Figuring out all the little tweaks about this thing was kind of annoying. Ah, Liberty again, in his great wisdom, claims to have never seen anyone put a motor on a cheap bike and grease all the wheel bearings. Whereas, I would admit, this is probably overkill for most of us. However, if you ride the bike the way I do in the terrain that I do, you probably want to get the most out of your ride, and greasing the wheel bearings certainly can't hurt. Plus, I've opened cheap wheel bearings before that had no grease on them whatsoever. So, at the very least, it's not a bad idea to check them. But, again, this is kind of an advanced thing, and I wouldn't recommend opening up wheel bearings unless you know how to readjust them. Otherwise, you're just going to create more problems than you had in the first place. Joe, I agree. An issue which might be unavoidable to some of you if you're installing an engine kit on a bike with a coaster brake. See, in many cases you have to remove the coaster brake in order to install the rear sprocket. With the Huffy Cranbrook, you're able to put it back on, but this is still going to happen whether you put the arm on or leave it off. It's unavoidable in many situations, but you might get lucky and not have to deal with it. What happened to me was when I removed the coaster brake, it loosened the wheel bearings in the rear hub. And I didn't notice this until after the install. Turns out the wheel was kind of just slopping around. So I had to go through the tedious process of readjusting the rear wheel bearings, and that's not fun. Adding the coaster brake arm is just another headache in the entire process. So if you're removing the coaster brake arm in order to install the rear sprocket, pay close attention to the wheel bearings on the rear hub. There's a very good chance that they loosened up. AIG Data has an interesting question about the coil on the Magneto. Now, I'm not an expert on this, so I'm sure someone in the comments will chime in to answer this better than I can. Uh, but I believe that the strength of the magnet and the number of turns on the coil is what dictates the voltage. More turns equals more voltage, stronger magnet equals more voltage. If you were to use a thicker wire, chances are you would have more durability but less voltage because you would have less turn. If you used a thinner wire, you would probably produce more voltage because you can get more turns on it. However, thinner wire is more susceptible to fatigue and breaking, so your durability might go down. I don't know. You guys can answer that. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Andy brings up an interesting idea that might help cure the overheating issue of the YD100s, which I might actually try in the future. But his idea gives me another idea. Now he claims that he's clamped on extension aluminum plates to help the head have more surface area and cool the motor better. I don't see that this could hurt anything, I might try it. But the idea that I came up with thanks to him was actually trying a GPU heatsink. Some of them are pretty big, and they're meant to withstand high temperatures. They're made out of aluminum and copper, most of them, so it's the same material used on the head. It might seem a bit far-fetched, but if I can get one to stick to the top of the head, I might try it out. Using some kind of thermal pad or thermal paste, which conducts heat between the two surfaces quite well. Who knows? Maybe we can get one to stay on there. 
and he has another question about the exact same bike we're using in this video. He wants to know how well the rear wheel and the spokes have been holding up since we put a motor kit on it. Well, if you guys have been following me for any length of time, you've heard me complain every once in a while about having to retrue the rear wheel on this particular bike over and over after every couple of rides, until eventually I just got sick of it and I bought a beefier setup. The rear wheel I'm using now has 12 gauge spokes, which most of you might not consider to be beefy, however compared to the rim that came on this bike, they're a substantial upgrade. Ever since I'm started using the rear wheel with the 12 gauge spokes, I haven't had to retrue it once and it's been holding out just fine. A comment which constantly shows up on my videos are people telling me to remove the fuel filter. This is going to be the last you're going to hear about it because I'm done answering this same question or suggestion. <laughs> they claim that removing the fuel filter will increase flow to the carburetor improving performance and that you don't need it because it's redundant. There's a screen on the petcock inside the gas tank designed to remove large particles from getting into the carburetor. Let's deal with the screen first. Sometimes this screen can come loose or break or not even be included with the kit. As I found out the hard way on the Huffy Cranbrook original build, the petcock screen actually vibrated loose and was no longer doing anything. It was just sitting in the bottom of the gas tank. Second, flow rate. There is no stock carburetor on any motorized bike kit that I'm aware of which can outrun the flow rate of a fuel filter. Unless you are running some big bore kit with a massive carburetor, you're going to be just fine as the flow rate of a fuel filter will always outrun the carburetor. Now, what happens? if you don't run an inline fuel filter and the screen on your petcock fails. Well, large particles get down in the carburetor and cause obvious issues. What happened to me was I dropped the gas cap in the sand when I picked it up, wiped it off best I could, put it back on the tank, the gas sloshing around, washed the rest of the sand out of the cap down into the carburetor because I thought there was a screen on the petcock. Turns out there wasn't. And it immediately clogged up the inlet jet which controls how much fuel goes into your carburetor. When this clogs up, it doesn't turn off, causing your carburetor to overflow, flood the engine, stall the bike. And if you're not paying close enough attention, you'll leak all your gas out when you stop the bike. So, that's something I don't want to deal with again. I'm always going to run an inline fuel filter, and I'm not going to lose any performance because of it. This is where uh, we parked last time when we rode out here with Henry during that giant rainstorm. And if I'm not mistaken, it should be just about 20 miles. Well, seeing that I've kept you guys waiting long enough, the maximum distance we traveled in one direction is 21 miles. It's actually 21 and a half miles. So now we have to turn around and go back and see how far we make it. I can't get biking directions offline. I'm going to double check it at the house, but uh, see this trail runs close along the highway the entire trip. And if I look at highway directions, um, it says it's 26 miles. Anyways, we'll double check it at the house. But uh, I was really hoping that that satellite app would be accurate. But uh, we, yeah, we've definitely gone further than that. 
and our average speed is more than 12 miles an hour. I'm going to have to find a better app. She ain't real heavy, but she ain't light either. She's just awkward, you know. Well, this is kind of awkward. Uh, I didn't expect it to actually make it all the way here. And uh, I don't want to run out of gas while I'm on the side of the road. But honestly, I think we're going to make it home. If we make it home, that's, uh, that's at least 40 miles.
<laughs> I knew I felt something hit my foot. If my baby don't get her monster, she'd be grumpy. Oh. <laughs> oh well. Thank you. Hey buddy. Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Lambay. There's a tiny, tiny little bit of gas left in that tank. <laughs> Can't even see it in there. She's empty, pretty much. So there you have it guys. This bike officially made 43 miles to a single 2 liter tank of gas. With a trickle left in the bottom, I'm confident we could have made 45 miles just as we ran out of gas. I'm going to call it a solid 40 miles to the tank. That gives me a bit of leeway. And yes, I am well aware that there are plenty of builds out there and riding styles which could have squeezed quite a bit more out of a single tank. But this just allows me to know how far I can confidently go with my riding style. The bike handled this trip without any issues whatsoever and I was pleasantly surprised to find out that I can ride for about two and a half hours without any soreness or riders fatigue. This was just a gas and go trip. We didn't take any breaks along the way other than shutting off the bike to get over some obstacles. We just kept going. So the seat bike handlebar setup it works out real well for me. Not all my bikes are set up to do this kind of endurance, but I'm happy to know that if I need to ever just get on the bike and go for 40 miles straight, I can do it and I won't be tired when I get there. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. We'll see you in the next one.